Good morning, everybody. It's Thursday, September 27th, and uh, we're in a sort of a lame duck kind of market. The market seems to be flopping around and uh, not not acting all that great, kind of sluggish, you know, neither here nor there, really. It's hard to say whether we're going to plummet to new lows or lower lows and break down from this uptrend. Uh, some might mention that, uh, you know, you're, you're in this sort of uh, ascending uh, wedge formation, and you've broken down, and this is very bearish. I mean, maybe, maybe so, but I think the key right now is with the market. You're seeing it break. Uh, you've seen it break before, but not this badly since we came out of this area, running up through through about the uh, 2990 area, so somewhere in here, 2980, 2990 on the Nasdaq. And so, since we've broken out from there, the market has been very uh, coherent. You know, surprisingly so, throughout August and then into September. And it's only now that we're starting to see this coherency sort of come apart, which is like, I don't know if that's necessarily a big problem. I think it really comes down to just watching your stock, stocks rather, and uh, your ETS if you're long silver or gold and just figuring out how you're going to handle those because it may be possible that we just flop around here for a while and don't really go anywhere uh, while we alternately look good and, and uh, you know ugly and good at the same time or on alternating days or intraday things flop around. You can see today we started to look like we were going to roll over there, and found, the market found its feet, and it's trying to rally off of this area. So you see the Nasdaq. Let's see if I can make this a little bit bigger for you. You can basically see, and it's, it's pretty simple. It's like technical analysis 101, really. You can see that when we had the breakout back here, I believe this is Fed Thursday. So that was a couple of weeks ago. Three weeks ago, we broke out. Nice volume. Everything was beautiful. Had a nice move up. So we pulled all the way back to that. So I don't necessarily know if that is a big problem. You know, it could mean the market just needs some time to digest things, particularly as the situation in Europe remains a little bit cloudy here and there, and there's the news of the day that always comes into play there. As the uh, election uh, kind of goes back and forth, I know that the pollsters keep saying Obama is building a lead, but I'm not so sure uh, that that's necessarily the case. And then I wouldn't necessarily rely on uh, trying to uh, game the market based on the uh, election uh, outcome, you can probably work it through in your head. There's all kinds of permutations. I mean, let's say, you know, you might think you'll get a Romney rally if Romney wins, but Romney has said that he would fire Bernanke. And uh, I saw an interview with John Taylor, who's a professor at my old alma mater, Stanford, and apparently he would be in line to become the new uh, Fed chief. And so, you know, what would he do? Would he stop QE? In that case, we might expect precious metals and maybe even stocks to, to come down pretty sharply on that basis. If Obama wins again, then maybe that means that we just are on an unending QE roller coaster and we're just going to chop our way higher forever until it all finally, the house of cards finally comes crashing down. And I think that's really you know, what, what's going on here? The market doesn't seem to be all that decisive one where there are some stocks get hammered one day, they're coming down into areas of support, they bounce. And so overall, it's very difficult to make any real progress on the upside outside of being involved in this rally in a number of stocks that have pocket pivots and that have moved up uh, reasonably well from prior buy points. So, so that's kind of where you're at. And could you be topping here? Sure. Could you just be going back and forth? Maybe you'd pull into the 50-day moving average uh, you know, we were trying yesterday uh, talking about what might happen. You could see a break of the 50-day moving average that would undercut this handle. That could shake everybody out, and then you'd see the market come out. That's kind of what we're watching for uh, in an opportunistic sort of way, uh, you know, if we might want to scoop some stocks coming down. And, uh, and so that's kind of where we're at. I mean, I'm not in long anything myself right now. I think we're minimally long. Uh, I know in most of the accounts that we manage, we've gone to cash, except for those accounts that use the market direction model, which I think are still long, silver and one uh, index ETF, and so they're hanging in there. But there's really no sell signal yet. Dr. K, there's nothing going on with the model currently, right? No, it's uh, sitting tight. Yeah, so you know, you're just kind of we're just hanging out here, seeing how this goes. Now, that doesn't mean I'm not watching this rally today and this bounce. I'm watching it very closely because this may be a point to come in on the short side, and I'll get to that in just a second. But there's really not, you know, in our view, not too much uh, that you have to do here unless you have stocks getting clocked and you need to bail out of them. Michael Kors, of course, becomes the uh, 
the darling that's now suddenly in trouble. You had a great Bible gap up on Friday, and what I don't like is the fact that this thing fails immediately. It almost seems like it was uh, manufactured because they put out the uh, earnings, uh, raising earnings guidance, earnings sales guidance on Thursday after the close, and then on Friday you got the big rally. The stock closes at fifty-seven thirty-five at all-time highs, and then the next day on Monday they're going to price this thing so it starts coming down. They priced it at 53, which seems pretty weak, given that the stock closed at 57.35 on Friday, and now that's kind of flopping around. This volume is exaggerated, obviously. My concern here might be that in the short term, any institutional appetite for uh, core stock, micro core stock, has been sated for now with that 20 million share secondary offering. The stock's probably going to have to put some time in. Where would I come back on the stock? Well, probably looking for a pocket pivot coming up through the 10-day. That's about the best you can hope for now. Meanwhile, the 50 days coming up, and maybe it pulls back or finds support at that line at some point in the future. But for my money right now, I don't own any cores, and uh, and I'm out. And I'm set with selling it out in here uh, before it started to get into some real trouble. And, and I don't really see any reason to sit with the stock right now, especially given the state of the market. Zillow was another stock that was, it's, it's acted okay, you know, you've had some nice accumulation in the weekly chart, it looked like it was breaking out, but somebody came out with a negative report, I think it was Citron Research, and questioning the whole business model and whether it's just going to become another one of these real estate websites uh, that has gone down the toilet, and maybe that's true. Uh, stock yanked back on very heavy volume to the 50-day moving, it's getting support, so I, I kind of like this bounce as a reason or a place to sell uh, into if I'm long the stock still because I don't really care for this action. And if I can shrink down this daily chart, let's shrink it down, you can actually see since the stock came public, hopefully people can see this, but you can see so here's when the stock came public and running to new highs here, but that's the biggest single day selling volume in the stock since they came public, okay? And I don't like that. And I'm not going to sit in a stock that's doing that. I'm going to look for an exit point. I think with the stock rallying today, uh, that gives you an opportunity to blow out shares or at least cut your position back with the idea that at most you would hold, a, you, you would sell at least on a violation of the 50 day moving average. Okay. Meanwhile, you've got silver and gold both found temporary support at the 20-day moving average. Now, I don't know if this becomes a buy point. And I know we said that uh, in our morning missive that you would use pullbacks to uh, accumulate silver and gold, and I would, but I think in the short term, this crack here tells me you want to lighten up a little bit and then hang out because your next buy point would either be some sort of a pocket pivot off the 10-day, possibly a pocket pivot off the 20-day moving average. Last year, we saw silver, not, not gold, but silver, actually uh, stuck to its 20-day moving average on the way up in the, in the beginning of uh, 2011 when we played that big move from around the low 20s up to 50, I think, in the first part of 2011. So that you know the 20-day could come into play, but the thing is you don't really get enough volume to constitute any kind of a pocket pivot volume signature, so the selling's been a little, more, a little heavier, and I think it probably implies you're going sideways. Now, some people want to apply a three-weeks tight pattern to uh, silver, you know, and, and uh, people say that O'Neill says he will often buy a three weeks tight on Friday if it completes before the actual breakout using the low of the pattern as his cut loss or I guess that's a stop loss point then he'll double up on the breakout I mean that's a technique I've used for years so uh, I'm you know I, what I would do is if I'm holding on to big silver position maybe I lighten up a little bit and then look to come back in aggressively on a pocket pivot or a breakout but I, I don't know if you know three weeks tight patterns necessarily apply to uh, commodities. You got any take on that, Dr. K? Well, if they uh, essentially are um, ETFs such as uh, silver or gold, in other words, they're focused state ETFs. They tend to trade more like a stock, so therefore the technical patterns would uh, apply uh, as opposed to most most ETFs, which are pretty wide banded. So do you think a three weeks tight pattern is something you would buy the same way? I think I just wait for a pocket pivot myself. Well, that's generally what I do. I usually don't go off the th three weeks pattern anyway. It's not something yeah. I use with stocks. Um, I find that uh, pocket pivots are more reliable. Right, and that's a better way to operate than just saying, oh, I can label this pattern this and I'm going to buy it. Uh, I think waiting for the action within the base is usually a good, the best spot to come into when you have some confirmation that it's about to get a, a move going uh, with a pocket pivot. So. So that's kind of our take right there. But yeah, you know, we think if you're real heavy and you played this move, 
uh, you might want to line up a little bit in here and just hang out. You know, there's nothing wrong with that. And you could be opportunistic on pullbacks. The 20-day moving average is one place, but notice how the 50-day has yet to come above the 200-day uh, on uh, silver. Gold, it already is above. And, and so you know, it seems to argue for some time at least for these to, to go sideways because you are up on, on gold, for example, you are up near resistance here. You have a couple of peaks in the pattern. So it's likely you'll need to go sideways. So you could watch the 50-day maybe comes up and it pulls back into the line at some point, and that might be an opportunistic buy point on a pullback if you like to buy them that way. Uh, but I think for our money, we're just going to hang out uh, with our position and see what kind of buy signal we get next without being too heavy and also being ready to move out if things do start to break down. Uh, and, and a lot of times with the metals, you do have to be quick. And if you have a nice game, you certainly don't want to squander that. So, you know, the other thing that's going on with the market is I think finally the what's going on with the transports and mostly economic sensitive stocks, not only the rails, but you're seeing it in Caterpillar as well. These things are breaking down, and transport index has been diverging very negatively, but I think it's just telling you that we continue to live in a very weak economic environment. And today's date, I think we, we had a negative 13.2 on the durable goods orders, that includes transportation orders, versus an estimate of minus 5%. So the 13.2% drop in durable goods versus uh, the expectation of a 5% drop, that's pretty bad, and it tells you that things are deteriorating. Uh, and, I, and I think that you know, some of that's reflected, or, or a lot of that's actually reflecting the action of the stocks, and it doesn't seem to be getting any better. Caterpillar has also been breaking down. I'm actually short Caterpillar here. Uh, I like this on the bounce off the 50-day moving average. I think it could break down. You kind of have a head and shoulders on the weekly, but it's a very complex sort of pattern. But to me, it looks like you're heading for this low, so I'm going to try and test that out, and so far so good, but we'll see what happens. It's very tough to come up with good uh, short sale ideas. We had talked about CMG previously up in here, and this is a big right shoulder, and has come off. Not a lot of heavy uh, volume selling, but now it's bouncing off the 50-day. This could be the beginning of a right shoulder that carries lower, so I'd be watching this bounce off the 50-day. If it's weak, it's possible you could short into it. Uh, just keep in mind, you know, whatever your stops are, three to five percent maximum on the upside. If you want to do that, so it's really not clear to me necessarily how, that you can make a lot of money other than uh, on the short side, other than engaging in some hit and run trades, which, as you all know, I will do, and uh, I'm happy to do so when presented with an opportunity. So, but I think in terms of investing or trying to play long-term downside trend, that's really not uh, clear, nor is it really that advisable. You got QE still out there, so you could just be in this sort of mushy. Uh, lame duck sort of environment where you don't really go anywhere. Things are sloppy and choppy and stocks don't go anywhere, but they don't really break down. And if we look at some of the stocks that we've liked, uh, Regeneron Pharmaceuticals is just pulling back to the top of its breakout point. You notice it's holding. So you again, you can use pullbacks towards the breakout. And I would look at any stock, you know, look at your buy list. If something's breaking down hard, like a Z, for example, Zillow, or some other stocks say like uh, I think solar winds this is really pathetic and this is what I hate about this stock when it goes up it acts beautifully but as soon as it starts to get in any kind of trouble it just blows wide open we saw that happen a couple of times down here but it is finding support at the 50-day moving average right now you know is that a viable point I suppose you could come in and step in and buy shares using a low today perhaps as a quick out or a violation of the 50-day moving average below this low this intraday low yesterday where it did close below the 50-day line and use that as your quick stop. So you know you, you could try to do those sorts of things. You look at Apple and what's Apple doing on the weekly chart. It has bounced off of its 10-week moving average, so that looks normal. And uh, right now you're pushing up to 670. You're trying to, and you've come off the 50-day moving average at the lows of this little zone here that it was in previously. So that's trying to hang in there. And I would say that the action so far is not necessarily abnormal. I would keep in mind though that you have seen some heavy volume on the way up here and here. Stock continues higher, but I'd be watchful of this because sometimes that can tell you that some institutions are starting to unload on the way up. But because there's so much ebullience about regarding Apple and you know, the fact that it's just this bulletproof company now, which as we know that's never the case with any uh, big leading stock. They usually will top when, when the situation and the fundamentals seem the rosiest. But uh, you know, that, that, all, all that's to say is that you could be under distribution. Maybe we see a further break then. I think at this point, you're just looking for a violation, a clear violation of the 50-day moving average. 
as a sign that Apple is rolling over. So in the meantime, it seems to act okay so far, but we'll see how things pan out as uh, today and tomorrow uh, progress. You know, Amazon is also looking okay here. It's pulled back to its 10-week moving average right, right down here. Notice how on the weekly charts, the 10-week moving average will tend to be in a different position. So you want to refer to both of those at all times to see whether you're pulling back into the 10-week or the 50-day moving average where you could get support, okay? And I think that's what you're seeing. But the thing is, Amazon did follow the 10-day moving average. You could say it just barely violated here. So, you know, the other thing is Amazon is not this wildly dynamic stock. Let's get real here. A breakout here at 230, a run up to 260 is like a $23 stock going to 26. And for any of you who've traded Nation Star Mortgage Holdings, you know that that stock can do that in a day. So it takes Amazon several weeks to make that sort of a move. And I think it's kind of... Uh, counterintuitive to think that a stock like Amazon would necessarily have to follow the 10-day moving average. The fact that it does for a period of time seems to be constructive, uh, but now all you're doing right now is trying to bounce off the 10-week moving average and see if that holds. But so far, you can't really say there's a breakdown there. For my money, if I was long the stock, I'd be peeling it out here and then just laying back and either looking to buy into a pullback to the 10-week or 50-day moving average if I think the market's still okay. And, or waiting for a pocket pivot coming back up above through the 10-day moving average. So, you know, the one thing I like about pocket pivots is that they give you a lot of re-entry points and they allow you to minimize uh, the uh, effect of a, a market that pulls back and suddenly you see your profits disappear. An example would be Michael Kors. And you look at that stock, our original buy point on that was around 48 on the viable gap up. It runs up to 57. That's a nice, you know, 15 couldn't somewhere around 15, 16, 17 percent uh, move or more, almost 20 percent. If I'm I'm calculating, am I calculating that right? Okay, 48 to 57.35. What is that? Yeah, it's close to 20 percent. Just under. Yeah, 20. I mean that's a big move. That's a nice move. And, and I think <laughs> if, it start to, if it starts to waver or it doesn't, you know, it has a display of strength one day and the next day it just kind of falls apart, like Coors did. You, know, you can just back away. And I like to run concentrated positions. And I was doing really nicely, you know, on, on Friday, but bailing out on on Monday because of this sort of weird reversal and uh, you know I want to keep those profits and now you barely have you know that much gain in the stock it's been cut in half roughly and uh, you know that's that that sucks okay so I like to try and keep my gains and I've actually had to adjust my trading in 2012 because the beginning part of the year you know I get long and strong and looking for stocks to continue trending and I'd be up 20 30 40 percent right away and then boom get nailed and I'm losing half of that and sometimes more and I just do that over and over again, and ultimately you're not really going anywhere, and I have these bursts where I'll make some progress. So I've tried to sort of use uh, pocket pivots to re-enter positions uh, if they strengthen again after showing some initial weakness, like Coors has up here, and I think that's pretty weak action. Um, and keeping my profits, you know, keeping in the bank, moving the cash, or at least raising a fair bit of cash and uh, operating that way. So just playing it close to the vest. Uh, let's see some other names that we have like Onyx again pulls back you know this thing's pulling back to the top of the space but 7878 is the top of the handle here so I think it could pull back further and that might be a better spot to be coming after the stock LinkedIn is another stock we still like but you know the breakout point here is uh, you know, I don't know how you can draw this any number of ways but let's just say that's your breakout point so you're coming down at like I believe you're somewhere around 112, 111 and change up in here. And that might coincide with the 50-day moving average. So I'd watch how this pulls back. But meanwhile, when I start to see it weaken and I don't really like this, you move up here, a little bit of stalling at the highs here, even here. And then notice how you come back up. But there's not really any buying volume. So when you kind of start to see that, and then on Monday I see the market starting to act a little strange, and I'm just out. I'm just blowing it out, and I'm looking to reenter my LinkedIn position on, on either a pullback to the 50-day or the top of the base uh, or looking for another pocket pivot coming up to the 10-day to re-enter. So I like to be in stocks when they're starting to trend. And what we see happen in this market over and over again is stocks will start to trend for a couple, three, four weeks, and then that trend will just kind of give way. Then they'll spend some time setting up again for several weeks and going higher again. So anyways, we have to be off of this webinar at about 8.45, 8.50 because we are doing a webinar for the Diversified Trading Institute at 9 o'clock our time. <clears throat> so what I want to do now is get to some questions, and of course here they come. <clears throat> so 
somebody's asking, please comment on CSU and Citrix. Not Citrix, CTRX is Catamaran. I mean, to me, Catamaran is kind of a slow, sloppy stock. I don't, it doesn't really thrill me, and it's a, uh, trades. It's, I mean, it trades. It's okay in terms of liquidity, but you got a pocket pivot here. It's not really going anywhere. It's holding up. I mean, that's okay, but I don't know about this base. You know, I can't really say it's all that great. It's had a nice move, so I'm not thrilled with it myself. Not something I really want to go in heavily here. Uh, but if you own it, there's not anything necessarily wrong with it right now. So that's all I have to say on that. CSU is a rail, and uh, isn't it? No, CSU is not a rail. What is CSU? That's that medical company for. Um, company. It's, uh, it's got like all these all these senior living. <clears throat> so it's just extended. So I don't, you know, I don't know if you sell it here or buy it or what. It's just extended. Not really anything thrilling there either way I mean if you own it and you bought it down here this is pretty thrilling but at this point it's just kind of hanging up there so you kind of have to decide what you're going to do people ask about Mellanox but all I see Mellanox doing is failing at its 50 day moving average I don't want to touch this with a 10 foot pull now the violation when it violated this low here which is this close under the 10 day moving average it violated here you could have been blowing out the stock and you know I have to admit like fools we held on to a little position not a big position in uh, Melanox for one more day just to see if it would find its feet and of course it didn't it slid some more and so we just got rid of it here uh, as soon as it gapped down uh, that morning I think it was a Tuesday morning or Monday morning I forget <clears throat> but in any case it finds some support at the 50 day and then it rallies back up but you never have enough volume for any kind of a pocket pivot so there's no new buy point all it does is fill the gap if you were still long to me that almost seems like a, a really fortuitous opportunity to unload your shares at a better price closer to 110 now you see the stock breaking down between the 50 day and you have a violation here of the 50 day moving average so my view is if you own the stock and you have this bump here towards the 50 day I'm almost looking at shorting this thing and if I were long it I probably would sell it Dr. K what would you do with it if you still owned it right now I would I would be out right now yeah so you know that's that's what we think about it and it almost seems like a short Unfortunately, I can't borrow the stock. So <clears throat> let's go through some more questions. We're going to get th these done. How many? No, we also had that it? one on um, the charts. I'll, I'll do that one. The uh, someone wanted to know about printing charts and making notes on charts and how how to go about doing it. Yeah, and, uh, I think printing charts is is excellent. I've, I've I I mean, they said the problem is they have stacks and stacks of charts. Well, yeah, so do I. I've got stacks of charts. And uh, they're all in you know different file folders, and uh, they represent different studies I've done on the market. Um, sometimes I like to test myself, so I'll actually take a piece of paper over the chart and step it forward a day at a time to see how it would actually trade that stock, given an idea of mine. And of course, I put different moving averages. I'll put 10 and 50-day moving averages. If I have an idea to utilize, you know, there was at one time I was utilizing the 20-day moving average a few years ago, and I found that the 10-day um, for, for for my purposes, works just as well, if not better. And and what's more important, whether you're using the 10 or the 20 or whatever, whatever your moving average is, make sure that uh, you keep it simple. I'd rather use a 10 and a 50 rather than a 10, 20, and a 50 um, if the 20 isn't really adding value to my trading. So I'll always keep that in mind. Keep th keep things as simple as possible. But research studies are great, um, very well carried out when you're printing out the charts because then you could always go back you know, a year from now, two years from now, and you can revisit those studies or revisit an idea. And uh, it, I find it much easier than, say, having uh, the charts on a computer where, you know, flipping through charts on a computer is just, it's just not as tactile. It's not quite as simple. And as Dakota always said, make sure you stay close to your roots. Get, get out that pencil and paper or pen, whatever, and, and, and do your markups. And, you know, he said it, it just, it's just more, uh, more visceral and uh, keeps you closer to your study. Rather than having uh, you know computers do all the work for you, I use my PCs uh, to scan charts. I scan them into my system, and I use Snagit, which is a a uh, program that allows you to grab charts and then mark them up. And I do it electronically, and then I save them as PDFs, and then I can store them on my iPad, so I can go through them and just check them out from time to time. So I take a completely different view. But I think that the technology available on PCs now allows you effectively to act like you're using a, a pen and a pencil when you're marking them up and putting new notes but you know I think everybody
finds what works for them and what they like, and, and so I think it's more a function of that than anything else. I mean, there's so much technology, or you could just do it the good old-fashioned way, using hard copies that you have to keep in files, which, you know, I kind of see more as something that's useful for starting a fire uh, than anything else, but that's just me. So, you know, you can do it that way, or you can keep it. But, you know, I do, I have to admit, I use, I am old-fashioned, and then I use a trading diary, which is just a little notebook that I write notes in all day long. So, so on the one hand, with my charts, I, I'm more modernistic, and on the, old hand, on the other hand, I'm old-school using a trading diary. Anyway, somebody's I asking... I would also I would also add that um, you know for when you're traveling it's not convenient to take lots of paper with you, and yeah. so what you can then do is you can uh, you can scan in your your marked up charts into an iPad or whatever, and you can then have them in folders as well. It takes a little bit of work, but uh, you know if, if you don't have to do that for every single chart, you know you can do that with the study in question or the or your favorite charts that taught you taught you something. Maybe they were part of your trading journal and you made some important notes on those charts so you know having a hundred charts that are scanned into your iPad so you can reflect on them when you're traveling is very useful yeah so and I know you like to use technology um, quite a bit Dr. Ken and you, you probably use more than I do anyways but you can see the markets sort of fizzling out here the Dow is up barely and S&P is kind of coming in um, I'm watching CAT come down towards 87 that's my short here so you guys can all watch that with me but I think it's going to break the 50 day my first target is this low here at 8178 we'll see what happens and yeah I'm running a big position in it uh, someone's asking Dr. K we're 921 and 919 churning days uh, that would count as distribution or was the daily range too limited let's go to that what days are those 921 would be here I consider that a distribution day 924 let's see 921 uh, I would look at that as a sort of a distribution. It was a churning day, but it was exaggerated volume as a result of. Uh, was there anything on that? Rebalancing. No, it, wasn't. it was no, rebalancing on. Uh, yeah, on rebalancing. That's right. So uh, yeah, now that you you, you know that volume is exaggerated, but nevertheless it closes you know near the low of its range. And, so you get uh, that one. You know, therefore that's a distribution day. What about nine nineteen right there? 919, nothing wrong with 919. I'm um, looking at the NASDAQ, uh, closes, closes near the top of its range. It was up slightly on greater volume. It's not churning because the volume wasn't excessive. Right. All right, here we go. FET. Whoops, what is FET? Forum Energy. Uh, I don't know, it's not really a stock that we're playing. It's it's a bit, I believe it's a little bit on the thin side, isn't it? Trades uh, 264,000, so it's too thin. I mean, I, you know, if you're asking us what you should do with it, that really depends on where your trailing stop is. You violated the 10-day moving average. I guess you could say it has followed the 10-day roughly. Here's a little minor violation intraday here. But would you use uh, would you use the 10-day moving average as a stop out point here, Dr. K? For for FET, well, you know these the problem with these oil stocks is they tend to trade pretty sloppy, and you know the ten day they usually don't obey the ten day very well. So if you're using the ten day, you're liable to get stopped out prematurely. That's one of the reasons I don't really I don't really favor these oil stocks, especially right now. I mean, unless they start making concerted group move, I'm not interested in playing them because they trade pretty wide band. In other words, you got to use the fifty day, and uh, you know and I don't I'm, I'm not real comfortable doing that with oil stocks. Yeah, especially in this market. Let's go through some names. Someone's give us a whole bunch of them. Disney, he had a breakout here. Nothing really since then. You know, just hanging out. It's holding the breakout. Nothing really there. Facebook. Facebook tried to come up and it failed miserably. And uh, you know, this brings up this occurred. And I, I have to tell you, I bought some of the stock here and had a position when this happened. Not a huge position. You know, ten, fifteen percent. So the thing can drop. 5% and it's only going to cost me half a percent or so to my uh, portfolio value, which is fine with me. But I can tell you that it's best, when, when you see something break like that, it should recover pretty quickly. And the fact that it flopped around, I just unloaded it and it's moving lower. So it was trying to come off the lows. You had a couple of good looking moves here, but it ain't happening now. So that thing's back, uh, back in the dumps as far as we're concerned. So we're not owning it. We're not buyers. We're also not shorting it. So Lumber liquidators to me held the 10-day moving average pretty well. I don't really consider this a close blow. It's too close, uh, but here you did kind of violate minorly. But still, you know, now it's broken down. I think it needs to go sideways. Had a nice move. I, if I owned it and I bought it in here, you know, you're still okay. 
But Dr. K, would you sell this one here on the basis of this 10-day moving average violation and wait for a new buy point, or would you just lose it and forget it, or hold? Basically, it? well, it has violated the you know it has violated 10 days, so I would have been out yesterday. Yeah. And uh, then, then you know, you just wait for it to set up again. It's made a nice move, you know, since the since the Bible gap up. So yeah, and I think we're on to it somewhere in here. It's one of these pocket pivots, really early. So you know, had a decent move, but again, it's the, the same old example. You know, 10, 15, 20 percent move in a stock, and that's it. And then it starts to break down. They act real well until they don't. And my view is, if I own something like this, or I'm playing it, and I did play this thing on the way up, uh, you know, sometimes I blow out my position, then come back the next day and buy it again. Uh, as long as they act well in this very uh, con uh, coherent, I guess is the best word to use here, I'll stay with it or keep playing it. And once it starts to get incoherent like this, I just go away. And the, you know that's the way we like to operate. I know some people want to hold stocks forever and have a stock portfolio, and I guess that makes for great you know cocktail hour conversation. But I don't I don't really have a portfolio. I trade stocks. Priceline it has had some pocket pivots coming up through the 200 day moving average. It's holding this pullback, but notice the 200 day has now crossed above the 50 day, or rather, the 50 day has dropped below the 200 day. So I'm not a buyer of Priceline here. I think this thing has an ugly pattern. You basically have two big waves down. It almost seems like you could get a third one. And I would say that also goes for a stock like Intuitive Surgical. Two big waves down, you could get another third one. And the same thing is going with, on with Intuitive Surgical. You know, it had some pocket pivots. It was trying to come up. And uh, I know Ross liked this one, and he played it. He was trying to play it, but he unloaded here very quickly, so he didn't mess around either. If it's going to come up, it should come up pretty quick, and it starts to break down a volume. Now this thing's looking like a short. Using the 50-day moving average at 499, let's make it 500 for a nice round number as your stock. It's looking pretty ugly. I don't really like this at all. And uh, I wouldn't be long Intuitive Surgical. I wouldn't be long Priceline. XHB, what the heck is that? What is XHB, Dr. K? Is that some uh, home builders? You know, I think it's pretty, the home builders ran up very nicely. And the XHB followed the 10-day moving average. Now you violated it. You can also go, just go to the individual stocks. Same thing roughly with Toll Brothers, and a nice move along the 10-day here. Now you're violating it. But what I think is interesting is that this is sort of an abnormal break. And I think that that's trouble or at least something that I don't want to deal with. And as I said before, if, some, if I own something and it's acting real nice, moving up, rolling in relatively well, and then suddenly it falls out of bed and you're seeing the selling picking up, to me that's a problem. I'd rather go away and uh, let it set up again. Yeah, a lot of these have had big moves as well over the last uh, few months. So, you know, this kind of uh, sharper pullback, maybe, you know, it's just uh, the corrective effect um, before they move higher. A lot of the home builders like the legislation that's coming through. So they've made, uh, in anticipation of that, made, made some pretty good moves. You know, PHM has, you know, made a good 70% move off its buy point and uh, ELLI and, well, NSM, yeah, DHI, a lot of these um, home building related stocks, LL, of course. Uh, have been looking good. So and wait the for them to stops. you know wait for them to set up again because if this if this group's move is legitimate and it might very well be due to legislation then um, then uh, they're going to be offering new buy points again. Yeah, I tend to think the the idea that housing is turning around is kind of mythological, but you know you get money moving in that direction and you have had some nice playable moves, so you can ignore all the news or speculation as to whether housing is improving or not and play the move while it occurs. Otherwise, once it's over, it's over. Financials getting whacked as well. They were acting pretty well, and you know, to me, this seems very skittish. You know, nice move in the XLF. You saw a lot of financials, Goldman Sachs, running up, and you know, Morgan Stanley, you know, running up. You saw a stock like Wells Fargo trying to break out. You know, but they, they just flop, and I think that's problematic. So I don't really care much for any of the financials. I think what's going on with the XLF probably tells you that there is an issue. Calumet specialty, you know, what do you got going on here? It's acting okay, so I think there's a little, you know, too extended. I mean, it's just in an uptrend, so I don't know what to tell you. Break out here and it's holding on, so what do you use as your stop? I think that's really up to you. I can't tell you what it's going to do from here. Um, Ellie May, I just love that name. I don't know why. Uh, I, I don't like this either. You know, this thing is trying to break out. It's just chopping around. I'm not. I'm not interested right now. It seems kind of cheesy. Yeah, the high volume reversal as well, and yeah, uh, you know, a lot of negative, bad uh, down down volume days. It's had a huge move, so perhaps again, it could be argued well, it's entitled to base out for a while here, 
and then yeah. if you know if if you know the, basically the QE uh, judgment is is favoring these types of stocks, you know, home building or mortgage related, any any kind of real estate uh, related stock um, right. is getting favored right now. So um, and, and again, you know, housing is probably going to, by best estimates, remain pretty lackluster over the next few years. But that doesn't mean these stocks can't uh, benefit from uh, from QE. Someone's asking about AutoZone as a short. If I look at the weekly chart, I think this is an ugly pattern and it looks failure prone to me. Yes, you just have the 10 week drop in below the 200 day moving average. This is actually on my short list. And I'm kind of watching it. You know, you could have shorted it this morning and you'd be up on it a bit. Uh, probably a breach here of the 50 day on volume might be a reason to go after it. I mean, I suppose you could always go after it here if you think the market's going to come apart. Uh, but AutoZone has been one of those stocks that has in the past started to look funky. You can see here. And in here, this is a really wide, loose, ugly pattern, but yet it still comes out. So you know, it's it's doable, and it's sort of setting up that way. <coughs> Excuse me, still getting over a bit of a cold. <coughs> Doctor K, is there a rule of thumb for exiting a position <coughs> if it is a certain percentage above the 10-day moving average, i.e., eight or 10 percent above? For for exiting and taking your profits. Yeah. Is that the question? Yeah. Yeah. No. I mean, generally speaking, um, it's well, it's always contextual. So assigning a percentage doesn't make any sense. I mean, the stock might have a very high relative strength, and for you to sell it just because it's ten percent above its ten-day moving average, right, um, is is potentially selling it way too soon. Sure. Likewise, you have a slow stock which might get ahead of itself in a difficult market. Yeah. I mean, then you know, there's there are there will be situations where you might want to take some profit it's kind of rare my style is generally not to sell in the strength I prefer to uh, sell in the weakness but in the markets we've been seeing since 2011 which are go nowhere trendless environments by and large uh, take it, taking profits you know reversing the rule and taking profits um, works better in this kind of environment um, again this is an unusual environment we're in but to know that you're in an unusual environment and maybe to switch gears a bit can, can be helpful once we do get a good uptrend, though, those who who sell on strength are going to be left behind. Um, the question is when we do get a concerted concerted uptrend, and uh, may, we might be a forward one right now, given uh, the QE situation. But there's so many cross currents, uh, you just have to watch your price volume action in your leaders, and then uh, and and decide based on uh, overall market and leader action um, what's going on. So somebody asked us to comment on recent profit pivots. Um, I don't really understand why a comment is necessary. NetSuite and you broke out of a base. This is also a pocket pivot. I think you had a pocket pivot in the in the handle or in the base here, and it's just holding up here. It doesn't tend to hold the 10-day moving average, so you wouldn't use it as your stop. Other than that, I don't really see anything else to uh, get get in the tizzy over. It's just kind of hanging out okay, and it's doing pretty well considering what the market's been doing. So it's holding in there so far, and showing some strength. Uh, New Star, this is one people have liked. We've never really gotten into it ourselves, but it has moved higher. And I don't know, I guess you would say, you know, here's a violation of the 10 day. Roughly, it tends to hold the 10 day moving average, but, you know, here's a close below and it violates here. So, you know, I don't know. I guess you can bail out of this if you wanted to, but so far it seems to be trying to hold up. PCRX, I don't, this stock, the Syrup Pharmaceuticals, it has nice moves up and then it jacks back in. You know, it's just chopping around. So I don't really play this. It's a real thin stock and it's really hard to get a grip on. You really have to buy when it looks ugly and then it turns around and runs up and then it comes back in. So it doesn't really thrill me. Somebody asked if members will learn new info at the Vegas trading show. Well, the webinar we're about to do in a few minutes for the DTI for uh, Diversified Trading Institute is uh, basically we're covering pocket pivots, viable gap ups, and the seven week rule review of those. And we're going to be doing that at 8 o'clock in the morning on November 16th as a primer, primer for our presentation, our four hour uh, hands on uh, intensive workshop and, and what we're going to be doing is just we're going to have a list of stocks ourselves and we're going to run through day by day trading simulations on all of them. We're just going to keep going through these for about three hours or so and then leave the last hour for some of you to bring up some of the stocks that you've traded and maybe we could run through a trading simulation, simulation on those 
uh, in the last hour, and that's pretty much our intent. And then after that, we all intend to go uh, hit the bar and have some martinis and then dinner. So as far as I'm concerned, the whole workshop, everybody there can follow us to the bar, and we can all mess the place up and turn over tables and whatnot. No way. I'm not advocating any, any unruly behavior, but you know that's pretty much the schedule on Friday. And uh, and I think it's midday we're going to be signing books. But if you want to want to get a sense of how a lot of this would work in real time, and just have us go in detail into detail on how various things could be handled using these rules and buy points, uh, then that's what you'll get from that. Uh, OSN, OCN, rather, what is this? OCN, not ONC. There's my dyslexia. Aquin Financial. That's holding the 10-day pretty well. Uh, I'd use a violation of the 10-day as your stop. That's about it. I'm trying to get through these because we have to finish up pretty quickly here. The yeah, VIX, we only got about five minutes. I mean, the VIX is, you know, what about the VIX? It's trying to come up. If the market blows, this thing's going higher. So, but other than that, I don't see anything else to do there. Uh, any success using MACD divergence uh, to buy stocks? No, we don't really do MACD divergence, although I do use MACD a little bit on my intraday trading system. Does Dr. K short individual stocks? Uh, depends. Usually not. Uh, for rocket stocks, I will because the the odds are so so much in one's favor. But rocket stocks are very rare, and they may occur only once a year, maybe twice a year. They're, so uh, yeah. it's a rare rare occurrence that uh, that that I will actually short an individual stock. Uh, Stratasys is not a short because here's the last breakout. It hasn't really failed there yet so it's not really a major breakdown however notice that you're starting to form but could be ahead so it could head for the 200 day moving average you're just kind of in the in no man's land right now so I'm not necessarily sure I would I would short that one so right now I'm having some minor amount of success with uh, cat SLV again we just talked about that any comments on so I don't know it doesn't really hit my radar been kind of an erratic stock. So it's a gap up today. I don't know. Is it a viable gap up? I guess if you want to buy it, you could. So, but not something that really hits our radar. Um, and I don't. And their earnings record to me is very spotty. Plus 27, plus 8, plus 150, minus 7, minus 14. Sales growth up 15 percent in the most recent quarter. This doesn't strike me as something that's high octane. But it, you know, you could treat that as a viable gap up if you really like the stock using the low of the day as your stop. Is the book out? No, actually right now we're working through the PDF files that we just got. And apparently we now learn that the book is going to be printed in full color, which I think is great because it uses makes use of color. And they were trying to, trying to convert that all to different grayscale. Uh, has there been a way developed to sign the Kindle version of your book? <laughs> I don't know. What are your thoughts on DeMarc's system with all this tech? No, we don't use it. Goog. Google stock that you know I pretty much completely missed. It broke out through this big base here, and has continued to go higher. But I never really seen it as all that exciting because uh, it's a 16% earnings grower. So, but it's but it's having a big move and money's been moving in there. So it acts okay. And I think at this point, you would probably be using you would be using the 10-day moving average as your selling guide, and that's about it. Other than that, I'm ticked off that I missed it. It ran through the 700 level and kept going. I don't think, however, that's the first time that has it has ever done that because you can see that if we go way back, it did trade above the 700 level back here. Now it's actually getting into all-time high price ground. So I don't know if this becomes resistance, but I think the bottom line here is if you do own it and you bought it lower, you can rest easy right now until you see it violate the 10-day moving average. So. If course does not hold the fifty-two dollar level post the, after the the secondary, which actually was released on Tuesday, would you blow out a core position, my core, not forty-eight? I mean, that depends on how you want to handle it. So, Dr. K, you want to talk about that? They're they're asking if if they would blow it out at the fifty-two dollar level. Yeah, if it they can't hold this low, in other words, would I can't hear you. If they can't, if they can't hold this low here around 52, would you just blow it out? Yeah, I would have been out, you know, when it violated the the gap up, really. I mean, yeah, and that's when it violated the secondary offering price of 53. So you had two exit points in the stock, and I wouldn't be sitting around right now. Yeah, um, no, I don't, I, mean, I don't care. Get it'll, 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 some, it'll do something, and that's uh, constructive. But right now, it's not showing anything, any evidence yeah. of that. And that's pretty much how we view it. So. 
you know, that's so that's where we're at pretty much with the market. I think you got to be cautious here, and there's nothing wrong with taking some profits, looking to re-enter if you get some nice pocket pivots or even some nice support off of say a 50-day moving average or a prior breakout point. So that's really all I have. We're going to go head off in about 15 minutes. We're going to start the DTI webinar, and I believe the way we do that, we're doing. I'm doing a presentation, and Dr. K is uh, taking instant messages and answering those. So we kind of divide the presentation where I'm doing the core, say, you know, schooling in the presentation, talking about viable gap ups, pocket pivots, and using the seven week rule. Well, Dr. K will engage you all with whatever questions you have uh, via IM. So if you guys want to move to that after this, we can all go there in 15 minutes. That'll give me a chance to hit the bathroom, make some more tea, and uh, and get all set for that. So we hope to see you guys in 50 minutes. Uh, Dr. K, can you send out the link for that to everybody so that... Uh, uh, it's already been done. Okay, so you guys should all have it. Out, we did a blast uh, through the newsletter and also through the other sites okay. uh, a couple days ago. Okay, if anybody doesn't have it, uh, email us right away and we'll try to get it to you ASAP. So we'll be watching for that. All right, you guys, thanks for showing up and we'll talk to you next time. All right, take care. Take care.